Welcome. My name is Divine. I am a fourth year medical student. In today's uh, episode of the Divine Intervention Podcast, we'll be talking about bacteria, primarily gram-negative organisms. So let's jump right in. So the first question says to compare and contrast the two Nicero species <clears throat> uh, to discuss the general gram staining characteristics, talk about having a capsule or not, talk about having a vaccine or not, what kinds of infections do these bugs cause? Uh, you see some question marks with glucose and maltose and growth media, and then we'll see some things about uh, how Nicero meningitis is uh, detected. So let's begin. So. Uh, the thing is, the two Nicera species you want to be concerned about for exams uh, Nicera meningitis and Nicera gonorrhea, right? Both organisms, two th- certain things they have in common is that they are gram-negative, okay, and they are gram-negative uh, diplococci, okay? Remember, your gram-negative cocci, that's where you have your Nicera species and your Moraxella species, okay? So the two Nicera species, they are gram-negative, they are diplococci, and they are actually uh, oxidase positive, okay? They are oxidase positive. So if you see diplococci on your exam, don't always jump to uh, strep pneumo, okay? Strep pneumo is a gram-positive diplococcus. Nicera species are gram-negative diplococci. Now, if you're looking at mm, the capsule business, Nicera meningitis does in fact have a capsule, so that's a high-yield virulence factor. Nicera gonorrhea does not. Okay, if you're looking in terms of vaccination, right, we know, I mean, before you start, in general, before you start school in the U.S., right, uh, at least uh, like middle school, you get your Nicera meningitis vaccine, okay, but there is no such vaccine against Nicera gonorrhea. And in general, Nicera meningitis tends to cause respiratory infections, okay, can cause respiratory infections. Nicera gonorrhea tends to cause sexual infections, right, so like genital infections, Although one thing you should keep in mind is if a person, for example, uh, gives oral sex to a person that has uh, like Neisserial gonorrhea urethritis, right, they can get a pharyngeal infection from that. Both organisms do in fact um, ferment glucose, okay, uh, so Neisseria meningitis and Neisseria gonorrhea, but it is only Neisseria meningitis that has the ability to ferment maltose. So remember the M in meningitis for the M in maltose. And with regards to growth media, the big thing you want to remember is the Thea Martin agar, okay? Both organisms grow on Thea Martin agar, and you can actually use PCR to detect Neisseria gonorrhea, okay? You can use PCR to detect Neisseria gonorrhea. So next question. So a 17-year-old college student presents with a 13-hour history of fever and severe headache. Physical exam is notable for a petechial rash on the left upper extremity and nuchal rigidity. What's your diagnosis? What's the bug? What's the demographic? How's this transmitted? Uh, what's the relationship to mucosal immunology, if you may? Okay. And then I'll say some things in relation to map. And then the final part of this question says, what's the diagnosis? If this patient loses consciousness, has a blood pressure of 50 over 30, potassium of 6.1, that's super high, and glucose of 45, that is super low. Okay. Now, What's the treatment? How do you treat this bug? How do you prophylax against this? So let's talk about this, right? So hopefully with all this information I've given you, right? So nuchal rigidity, fever, headache, college student. I hope you're thinking about Neisseria meningitis, okay? So Neisseria meningitis, again, it's a gram-negative diplococcus, okay? It grows on Thea Martin agar, okay? Um, Thea Martin agar is actually chocolate agar, but you actually add some antibiotics so that normal flora does not grow. So you're selecting for Neisseria species, like Neisseria meningitis. Okay. Now, uh, the classic demographic are military recruits, so like college students, right? So people in dorms. So if you see mention of like college students, military recruits, dorms, think about Neisseria meningitis. Um, with regards to the method of transmission, this is actually transmitted by uh, respiratory droplets, okay? And one high-yield relationship to mucosal immunology is that Neisseria meningitis actually expresses IgA protease. Remember, IgA is a dimer. It's a dimer immunoglobulin that protects the mucosal surfaces. So if you want to be any kind of pathogen that wreaks havoc on mucosal surfaces like Neisseria, uh, like Neisseria species, you want to have IgA protease to help with that, right? So you cleave IgA, so it's ineffective. Now, the eculizumab connection I'm I'm talking about here is that 
Um, if they describe a person that tends to get recurrent niceral infections, I really hope you are thinking of a C5 through 9 deficiency. Okay. Uh, remember, if you have a C5 through 9 deficiency, you have an increased risk of recurrent niceral infections. Remember that those are the constituents of the membrane attack complex. And the relationship to eculizumab, remember eculizumab is used to treat paroxysmal nocturnal hemoglobinuria. Uh, that's where you have like a pH in mutation, so you don't make, uh, you basically don't have GPI anchors like CD55 and CD59. Uh, I mean GPI anchored proteins like CD55 and 59 on the surfaces of your red cells, right? So complement comes and explodes your red cells. So the drug of choice in the treatment of that disorder is... Um, Eculizumab, which is a monoclonal antibody against C5, okay? So the thing is, by giving eculizumab, you're inducing a pharmacological C5 deficiency. So those patients should actually be placed on Neisseria vaccines. Okay, now, um, the diagnosis. So what's the diagnosis, right? So notice this patient loses consciousness, is profoundly hypotensive, has hyperkalemia, and has hypoglycemia. Um, if I add in this extra information that this patient is bleeding from every site, what do you think about? Well, I hope you're thinking about waterhouse Fredrickson syndrome, okay? Uh, this is bilateral adrenal hemorrhage that you get with Neisseria meningitis, severe Neisseria meningitis infection, okay? It's usually like a disseminated infection. And the reason this patient has hyperkalemia, right, is because the adrenal gland is basically gone, okay? If the adrenal gland doesn't work, Aldosterone is not released. And remember that aldosterone helps you dump potassium into the urine uh, at the level of the principal cell. Okay, so if you have like an aldosterone deficiency, if you may, with waterhouse Fredrickson syndrome, you get a hyperkalemia. And also remember that cortisol is a diabetogenic hormone, okay, that comes from the zona fasciculata of the adrenal cortex. Okay, so if your adrenal gland again is not working, you're not making cortisol, so you're not increasing blood glucose levels. Because remember, cortisol is a pro basically the incre cortisol basically increases your blood glucose levels, right? Under uh situations of stress, so you can deal with that stress better. Let's say you need to run or work harder for that uh for that stress to pass away, right? To increase your amount of glucose in the serum. So this patient basically has <clears throat> Uh, findings consistent with adrenal insufficiency, okay, from Waterhouse Fredrickson syndrome. So that's one thing you certainly want to keep in mind. And in general, if a kid, if a very little kid like a neonate has Neisseria meningitis, <coughs> you want to give a third generation cephalosporin like cefotaxim, okay. In adults, you usually jump to ceftriaxone, okay. The reason you avoid uh, ceftriaxone in neonates, right, so like the first 20 days of life, is that ceftriaxone can cause a cholestasis, which can uh, precipitate uh, like some liver problems in neonates, okay. So you generally go to cefotaxim route. They are both uh, third generation uh, cephalosporins. Now, for prophylaxis, uh, so close contact, right, of a person that has Neisseria meningitis, uh, generally you use rifampin for that, okay, but you could also use Cipro, uh, which is a fluoroquinolone or, uh, or ceftriaxone. So just something high yield to keep in mind with that. Okay, so let's go to the next slide. Now, 22-year-old sexually active, ding, ding, ding. So 22-year-old <laughs> sexually active college student presents with a three-day history of migratory joint pain and a purulent penile discharge. Okay, so what's the diagnosis? Uh, and I'm asking, okay, what's your diagnostic testing? Uh, what's the structural feature that increases infectious potential, especially for the urinary tract? Okay. And then common presentations in women, neonatal ophthalmology and prevention. Uh, we're going to compare this bug with chlamydia, right? So if I'm saying compare with chlamydia, that means the answer to this question should not be chlamydia, right? Yeah. And then let's talk about how this bug is treated, right? So obviously, you know, I'm talking about Neisseria gonorrhea. Now, Neisseria gonorrhea, um, classically, diagnostic testing, you can take like a swab of like the purulent discharge that this patient has, uh, you do a smear, you do a gram stain, and you'll see gram-negative diplococci, okay? Gram-negative diplococci. But another thing you can do <coughs> is PCR. In fact, PCR is probably one of the more common things that are done right now to detect Neisseria gonorrhea, okay? And one thing that Neisseria gonorrhea has going for it that makes it possible to attach to the urinary tract is, is that it has pili. Okay, it has pili. Uh, don't forget another high yield thing 
uh, if you're sort of drawing a correlation here, is that E. coli, the reason E. coli causes a lot of UTIs is that it has a fimbria that enables it to attach to urinary epithelium. Now, the common presentations of Neisseria gonorrhea in women, right? It can present as an infection of the cervix, so like cervicitis. It can present with a PID. It can present as PID, so pelvic inflammatory disease. And <clears throat> if they actually describe a person, right? So sexually active, college student, blah, blah, blah. And the patient has right upper quadrant pain. I really want you to think about Fitzhugh Curtis syndrome. Okay, that's an infection, an isceral infection of the liver capsule. Okay, it's not only Neisseria that can cause that kind of infection. Any bug that causes PID can also cause that kind of infection. Okay, but a liver capsule infection, right upper quadrant pain, sexually active person, think about Fitzhugh Curtis syndrome. Okay, and it can be a sequelae of Neisseria meningitis. I mean, Neisseria gonorrhea. Now, with regards to neonatal ophthalmology, right? So if a lady has gon gonorrhea and the kid passes through the birth canal okay those nice serial bugs can cause a conjunctivitis in the neonate and it's usually super 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 purulent okay so that's why in general most kids that are born in the u.s they get uh, prophylactic erythromycin ointment to prevent uh, ophthalmia neonatura that you could get with nicera gonorrhea from passing through the birth canal Okay, and in general, if you're comparing Neisseria gonorrhea with chlamydia, um, the discharge you get from the vagina or the penis in uh, chlamydial infection, it tends to be not as purulent as what you get with Neisseria gonorrhea. It's not usually purulent, it's more watery and it's more clear. Okay, so that's another high yield thing you want to know. Um, and if you do a gram stain, in general, you don't see anything with chlamydia. And I will just tell you this, that chlamydia is actually a much more common STI than Neisseria gonorrhea. Okay, so just something to keep in mind. If they give you a very non-specific question where you're just supposed to make a diagnostic prognostication uh, with regards to STIs, think more about chlamydia. It's a lot more common than Neisseria gonorrhea. And in general, Neisseria gonorrhea, you... Typically treated with ceftriaxone. Remember, ceftriaxone is a third generation cephalosporin that covers Neisseria species really well. So you give ceftriaxone, but you also give azithromycin. Okay? Uh, by giving azithromycin, you can cover concomitant chlamydial infection. Although um, there are actually some Neisseria gonorrheal species that are resistant to ceftriaxone monotherapy. So adding azithromycin actually decreases that resistance, okay? So that's just another thing to keep in mind. Another cocktail you could use is ceftriaxone plus doxycycline. Remember, doxy can, uh, is a tetracycline, so 30S inhibitor that is bacteriostatic, also covers chlamydia. So just something else to keep in mind there. So uh, I hope with this question, um, you sort of see how uh, Neisseria gonorrhea presents. I think you should be able to answer any Neisseria gonorrhea question after this. So let's go to the next one. A three-year-old male is brought to the pediatrician by his concerned mom. He has been tugging his ear and wincing in pain for the past two days. Otoscopic exam is notable for erythema and decreased mobility of the tympanic membrane, right? So this kid obviously has otitis media. A gram stain of purulent material around the eardrum reveals gram-negative circular organisms. Okay, what's the bug and what are your treatment strategies? Okay, so this kid clearly has nice uh, otitis media, okay? And there are certain bugs that commonly cause otitis media, right? So like strep pneumo commonly causes otitis media. Viruses are probably one of the most common overall causes of otitis media. Um... Uh, Moraxella cateralis also causes otitis media. Okay, remember that's a gram-negative coccus. And uh, non-typable H flu also causes otitis media. In fact, the most common cause, very high you to know this, the most common cause of otitis media, the most common bacterial cause of otitis media is non-typable Haemophilus influenza. Now, this question says you do a gram stain and you see gram-negative circular organisms, right? So gram-negative cocci, okay? If you see gram-negative cocci, that should help you rule out strep pneumo, and that should also help you rule out H flu. H flu is not a coccus, okay? So this leaves us with, leaves us with uh, Moraxella cateralis, okay? Moraxella cateralis is actually a fairly common cause of otitis media. And the way you treat this infection is with the same drug you use to treat most 
kinds of otitis media okay use a combination of amoxicillin and a beta lactamase inhibitor like clavulanic acid okay so amoxicillin and clavulanic acid right you are augmenting the activity of amoxicillin with clavulanic acid uh that's why the drug is called uh, augmenting uh, i'm just making that up but amox clavulanic acid is actually in fact uh, augmented so short question there so let's jump up to the next one question five uh, 23 year old cystic fibrosis patient is brought to the ed by his mom his temperature is 105 that's super high he has had significant respiratory difficulty for the past three days that is worse than his normal baseline what's the bug uh what are its special characteristics right so uh let's just sort of take this step by step right so this bug obviously is uh pseudomonas okay so cystic fibrosis cystic fibrosis patient with pneumonia one big thing you definitely want to think about on your exam is pseudomonas, okay? And in general, on exams, the most common cause of pneumonia in a CF patient that is less than 21 years old is staph aureus. But when that CF patient becomes greater than 21 years old, then you're thinking about pseudomonas, okay? And when the CF patient is like about to die, like when like they infect like their disease is like terminal you also want to begin to think about some exotic organisms like uh, bocoderia sepatia okay bocoderia sepatia now so this patient has pseudomonas aeruginosa infection okay uh a few characteristics with pseudomonas is it's a gram negative rod okay it's a gram negative rod um it's oxidase positive and it's actually catalyst positive as well, right? So if a person has chronic granulomatous disease, right? So any DPH oxidase deficiency, they can get recurrent pseudomonal infections, right? Because again, pseudomonas is a catalyst positive organism, right? That's what the last part of this question is talking about, where I say, uh, why would a patient with a negative NBT test get recurrent pseudomonal infections, okay? Now, all the virulence factors that Pseudomonas has going for it is that it is an encapsulated organism, okay? So if a person has a splenia, right? So like a sickle cell patient, again, they can have life-threatening Pseudomonas infections. In addition, Pseudomonas has uh, an exotoxin. It's called exotoxin A. Exotoxin A actually ADP ribosylates elongation factor 2, okay? So that decreases protein synthesis, right? So... Hopefully, you can make the correlation between the exotoxin A of Pseudomonas and your protein synthesis inhibitors, right? Like your aminoglycosides, your tetracyclines, your chloramphenicol, your macrolids, your linazolid, and your streptogramins, okay? So, you decrease protein synthesis with the exotoxin A that comes from Pseudomonas. Now, um, all the high yield things with uh, pseudomonas you want to know is that it produces certain pigments. Uh, the most commonly tested one on exams is biocyanin. Okay, it's a blue. It gives it a blue green color. Okay, in fact, that's why if you see like burn patients and you see like pus from their wounds and it has like this bluish green color, uh, you really want to think about pseudomonas, right? Pseudomonas is a fairly common infection in burn patients. And uh. Uh, pseudomonas usually smells like grapes, right? So if they describe a burn patient and they say like, oh, this patient person has like cellulitis or whatever, and the pus or whatever, like has like this grape-like smell, or they describe a hospital, like a burn unit in a hospital that has like a grape-like smell, you want to think about pseudomonal infections. Uh, pseudomonas, the classic demographics, right? So uh, it has an association with water, okay so it can cause hot tub folliculitis right so if they describe a skin infection in a person that is an avid swimmer think about hot tub folliculitis with pseudomonas although the most common cause of folliculitis i will say like in a non-swimmer uh you probably want to think more about staph aureus with that and please uh, do not confuse hot tub folliculitis with hot tub lung hot tub lung is a very severe um respiratory slash lung infection that's associated with mycobacterium avium intracellulare right so remember that bug that is supposed to prophylax with uh, azithromycin in a hiv patient when their cd4 count drops below 50. now another classic demographic for pseudomonas is in a burn again a burn patient uh, in fact one classic presentation on exams could be a burn patient having like a necrotic ulcer on the skin 
Um, that's something known as ecthema gangrenosum. It's a very high yield association for exams with pseudomonas. Okay, so it can present as a black scar. Okay, so a black scar is not something that is only specific to bacillus anthracis. Okay, uh, a black scar is also a finding you could get with uh, cutaneous pseudomonal infections. Now, uh, pseudomonas, right, if they describe a person that has like bone pain or osteomyelitis from having stepped on a nail that went through like sneakers or like uh, workout gear, again, also think about uh, pseudomonas, okay, pseudomonas leaves in, uh, there's a lot of pseudomonas in shoes and in sneakers. Now, uh, again, also think about your cystic fibrosis patients with pseudomonas. That's another thing you want to think about. And I will say in general, those are the people that uh, classically uh, get pseudomonas on uh, on exams. Although, also don't forget your CGD relationship with the NADPH oxidase deficiency. And the drugs that cover pseudomonas are super, 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 super high yield for exams. Okay. The classic drugs you want to be aware of for exams include drugs like uh, piperacillin and tazobactam. Okay. Remember... Uh, pip uh that's like what's called zosin in hospitals, or vitamin Z, if you may. Uh, pip tazo, uh, tazo is a beta lactamase inhibitor. Piperacillin is a, is a kind of penicillin. Okay, it's an anti pseudomonal penicillin. Um, your amino glycosides, right? So like drugs like gentamicin, neomycin, um, amikacin, streptomycin. And uh, if you're talking about like the cystic fibrosis patients, inhaled tobramycin, uh, those drugs all cover pseudomonas. Your fluoroquinolones like ciprofloxacin, levofloxacin, moxifloxacin, gadifloxacin, they all cover pseudomonas. And then certain cephalosporins also cover pseudomonas. Uh, I'll say like the third generation cephalosporin, ceftazidine, those cover pseudomonas. And then the fourth generation cephalosporin like cefepine also covers pseudomonas. So those are high yield things you want to know in relation to pseudomonas. So let's go on to the next, uh, to the next question. So a 59 year old smoker presents to the ED with a three day history of diarrhea and shortness of breath. Temperature is 101, that's high. He recently visited a resort in the Bahamas that had an artificial waterfall. Ding, ding, ding. So what's the bug? What are the special characteristics or means of transmission? Uh, what's the classic presentation? And what's the classic exam symptomatology, if you may? How do you diagnose this infection and how do you treat this bug? Okay, so if you see waterfall, you see pneumonia, and for example, let's assume they give you a chest x-ray where you see interstitial infiltrates, you really want to think about Legionella pneumophila, okay? Legionella pneumophila. Uh, so this is Legionnaire's disease, okay? So what are some special characteristics of Legionella, okay? Legionella, um, it's a gram-negative organism, although it doesn't gram stain very well because it has like some branching fatty acids in its, uh, in its uh, cell wall. Um, Legionella does actually stain pretty well with silver, okay? So while we're on the topic of silver stains, please don't forget that Pneumocystis gerovetsi and H. pylori also stain pretty well with silver. And Legionella, the thing is, it's an intracellular pathogen in general, and it grows very well on chocolate yeast, uh, like, sorry, charcoal yeast extract that you enrich with iron and cysteine. So that's another thing you want to know. And here's one way they'll try to trip you up on exams with regards to the means of transmission, okay? Legionella is not transmitted through person-to-person -person contact. Even if it's a respiratory infection, right? It is actually not transmitted through person-to-person -person contact. It's actually transmitted through inhalation of aerosolized fluids, okay? That's why it has an association with like air conditioning or with waterfalls or with like mist, Okay, so those are high yield things you want to think about with uh, with uh, Legionella. Now, the classic presentation, okay, uh, I think of Legionella as being pneumonia plus, okay. So the person will present with uh, like high fevers, uh, walking pneumonia, you get a chest x-ray, you see like uh, interstitial infiltrates. And these patients tend to have diarrhea, okay. And they also classically have the CBC and anom uh, the BMP anomaly of hyponatremia. Okay, so if you see a person that has pneumonia, okay, it was recently exposed to like air conditioning or a business conference or a waterfall, and they have hyponatremia, 
and they have uh, respiratory problems and you see like interstitial infiltrates on a chest x-ray think about legionella pneumophila okay think about legionella pneumophila and the way the diagnosis is made is with a urinary antigen assay okay and treatment of legionella like all other causes of atypical pneumonia is with a macrolid okay like erythromycin clarithromycin azithromycin if you may now uh, I guess with that, we can jump up to the next question. So a med student presents to the ED with a temperature of 104 and a painful ulcerating lesion on the left upper extremity. Physical exam is notable for significant left axillary lymphadenopathy. Okay. He took a year off to study targeted therapy in rabbit models of the brain. Of the brain malignancy glioblastoma multiforme so let's assume this is a med student that wants to match into neurology or neurosurgery or ent or whatever so uh studying uh, targeted therapy in rabbit models of uh, gbm okay so rabbits so what's the bug okay what are the special characteristics or means of transmission of this bug and what's the classic presentation okay so if you see rabbits on your exam okay you want to think about a uh, uh, francisella okay francisella tularensis okay causes tularemia it's a gram negative rod okay and it's actually a zoonotic infection now there are certain ways you can get francisella on exams okay one way you could get francisella is to just to uh, inhale like the aerosolized secretions of rabbits okay or let's assume you directly come into contact with secretions of a rabbit you could get tularemia with that alternatively a tick that bites a rabbit right like a dermacentor tick for example that bites a rabbit uh, and then goes on to bite a human being could also transmit uh, uh, tular uh, tularemia that way okay so very high yield to rem remember that if you inhale the aerosolized secretions of francisella tularensis or you're bit by a tick okay uh, like the dermacentor tick that bites a rabbit uh, you could get uh, uh, tularemia from that. And the classic presentation is the, the part of your skin that is inoculated with, uh, uh, that's like beaten by the tick or comes in contact with uh, like, uh, let's say like, uh, like, uh, your, like you, your skin is abraced by like the, I don't know, by like, I don't know, the fingers or nails of the rabbit or whatever. Uh, that site of inoculation, you tend to get an ulcer, okay, at that site, and then you also get lymphadenopathy, right? So the lymph nodes that drain that ulcer, uh, you tend to get the lymphadenopathy with that, okay? But the big thing you want to keep in mind is that they will give you a person that they will give you, like if you see rabbits in an MBME question, and the person has fever, and there's an ulcer, okay, uh, like on the skin, and uh, you see like lymphadenopathy that's very proximal to the ulcer think about uh, tularemia okay from francisella tularensis uh, francisella is actually a gram negative rod so that's all you need to know with that buck so next question a four-year-old female in california is rushed to the ed by her concerned parents okay she has had a severe cough for the past seven days these episodes have occasionally been associated with vomiting that's a very high yield association to know a fundoscopic exam is positive for a subconjunctival hemorrhage. That's another high yield association to know. The white count is 60,000 with a lymphocytic predominance. That's another super high yield association to know. Basically, with this clinical presentation, I've given you the details that will almost certainly make its way to any exam question you'll see that tests this bug. Okay? Now, What's the bug? What's the diagnosis? Uh, what are the stages of disease? What are the virulence factors? Uh, any special characteristics or growth media for this bug? How do you prevent this bug? How do you treat and how do you prophylax? Okay, so with all these questions you're seeing, you can probably tell that this is something how you, you want to know for tests. Okay, so this patient clearly has whooping cough. Okay, whooping cough. Okay, and remember whooping cough is caused by bordetella pertussis. Uh, this is actually a vaccine preventable illness, okay? So you could get the toxoid vaccine, the Tdap vaccine, or you could get the DTAP vaccine, okay? Although you generally get boosters of those vaccines because immunity wanes after like eight to 10 years uh, of you receiving your initial vaccine. So it's actually preventable. 
and I'll just talk about the treatment right now so I don't forget. You generally treat um, bordetella pertussis with a macrolid like erythromycin and it's also good to know that because that's also the way you um, that's also the way you treat close contacts right that's prophylaxis so that they don't get the they don't get the infection now certain high yield things you want to know about the pertussis is that it's a bacterial infection but you uh, unlike most bacterial infections where you get a predominance of neutrophils as a reaction to that infection you actually get a predominance of lymphocytes so if you see bacterial infection with a lymphocytic pleocytosis, think about Bordetella on exams. That's one thing. Second thing is that these patients tend to get a very nasty cough, and that cough is classically associated either with, on exams, either with vomiting or difficulty breathing or a subconjunctival hemorrhage. Those are like three very classic exam presentations. Like they say, oh, this person coughs and they're out of breath. I will encourage you to look up a YouTube video or something of a whooping cough. It's actually pretty striking. Now, another thing you want to know with uh, Bordetella pertussis is that um, is that uh, is a gram-negative rod, okay? And one high-yield virulence factor would be pertussis is the pertussis toxin. That's a very uh, imaginative name. The thing is, the toxin has a relatively high yield mechanism of action because it's unusual, okay? So the way the toxin works is that it inactivates GI, okay? So an inhibitory G protein coupled receptor. And when you inhibit GI, okay, you uh, actually increase the activity of adenylate cyclase. And if adenylate cyclase activity is increased, you have an increase in cyclic AMP. Okay, that's why you get many problems with Bordetella pertussis. Another virulence factor is a protein that it expresses hemagglutinin. Uh, hemagglutinin, you may have, you may remember that I talked about this with the influenza virus. But the thing is, the hemagglutinin that's expressed by Bordetella pertussis actually binds to the cilia that you find on the pseudostratified columnar epithelium of the respiratory tract. Okay, and when he binds, he basically grinds those cilia to a halt. And remember that cilia are necessary for the clearance of respiratory pathogens and mucus. Okay, so if those cilia are non functional, okay, you then basically open up your respiratory tract for infection. That's one. And two, because you cannot whip away um, uh, noxious uh, substances, your airways become hypersensitive to anything you inhale. Okay, that's why you again you get a lot of whooping cough with Bordetella pertussis. And while we're on the topic of cilia, please do not forget cartaginous syndrome. Okay, uh, primary it's another buzzword name is a uh, primary ciliary dyskinesia. Okay, uh, remember these people tend to get like recurring respiratory infections. Uh, basically, anywhere you have cilia in the body, they will get problems in that system, right? So. Uh, like the respiratory tract, they remember the pseudostratified columnar epithelium uh, that has cilia. Okay, so they get tend to get recurrent respiratory infections. They get uh, infertility because remember the fallopian tubes uh, have uh, cilia. Um, they tend to get um, uh, hearing loss. Okay, because remember uh, you have a cilia as part of your hearing apparatus. Okay, so. Uh, don't forget uh, that cilia association. I just decided to talk about that here since uh, one of the virulence factors, hemagglutinin, with uh, Bordetella pertussis basically grinds the cilia just in your respiratory tract. So the cilia in your respiratory tract uh, to a halt. And the way you actually acquire Bordetella pertussis is through respiratory droplets. So just something to keep in mind there. Okay, now the stages of disease with Bordetella pertussis uh, I remember that with uh, the mnemonic CPC, okay? So the first C stands for the catarrhal phase, okay? Where you basically just feel like crap. You have like runny nose, you have like mouth fevers. And then there's the paroxysmal stage where, again, you get the nasty cough. It's usually worse at night with inspiratory whoops, okay? So like, <gasps> right? And again, if they describe a kid that has like really nasty cough for like weeks and weeks on end, where the kid has a subconjunctival hemorrhage 
or vomiting or is out of breath at the end of each coughing episode, think about Bordetella pertussis. And Bordetella pertussis, uh, so you have the catarrhal phase, the paroxysmal uh, phase, and then you have the convalescent phase where you're recovering, okay? And uh, if you want to isolate brief pertussis, you can use the body Jinju uh, media or you can use the Regan Lu media, okay? Those are two things that are uh, definitely exam testable. And treatment is with a macrolid like erythromycin, okay? With a macrolid like erythromycin, although don't be an anti-vaxxer. Vaccinate your kids so they don't run into these uh, kinds of problems. Okay, next question, a second to the last. So a Kentucky family that resides on a goat breeding farm brings their six-year-old daughter to the ED with complaints of high fevers for the past seven days. Okay, these fevers, right? So goat breeding, that's one key buzzword. High fevers, that's another key buzzword. These fevers are worse at night. That's another key buzzword. So imagine that these fevers are better during the day. So it's like a waxing and waning fever. Now, the child's clothes are drenched from profuse sweating, even with outside temperatures of 50. Okay, that's another key buzzword. So what's the bug? Okay, what are its special characteristics? And what is the classic association? What are the classic associations slash uh, presentation with this bug? Okay, so if you ever see farming, right, like exposure to like sheep, or cattle or goats and then they describe a person that has fevers that wax and wane classically the fevers are worse in the evening and better during the day right so like like uh picket fence fevers if you may okay ondulant fevers if you may i really hope you're thinking about brucellosis okay brucella uh, from a brucella species okay so this is brucella uh brucella is a gram negative rod is a zoonotic infection okay uh, it's zoonotic because you again you classically get it from cattle or from sheep or from pigs or from goats okay so if they give you an exam question that describes a person that works in a slaughterhouse or a person that lives on a farm or a person that consumes unpasteurized goat milk okay and then they present with like fevers and very severe sweating that's a high yield association and they say that, oh, this person has fevers that are worse at night and better during the day, right? So, ondulant fevers. Think about brucellosis, okay? Think about brucellosis. And uh, the last part of this question that says uh, megaloblastic anemia in an infant with a strict goat milk diet, this is one of those questions for, it's more step two like, but it's one of those things that could potentially show up on step one and most people will get wrong. OK, so hopefully you won't get it wrong because you listen to this podcast. But the thing is, infants that take a strict goat milk diet actually tend to get a folate deficiency, OK, which can present again as a megaloblastic anemia where the MCV is greater than 100. OK, and you see hypersegmented neutrophils on a blood smear. So just something high yield to keep in mind. Keep in mind there. OK, so again, brucellosis, profuse sweating, ondulant fevers, Exposure to cattle, uh, sheep, goats, pigs, slaughterhouse, unpasteurized goat meal consumption, things like that. That should tip you towards the diagnosis. Okay, so next and the last question. A 26-year-old female is intubated in the ICU three days after presenting with bilateral low extremity weakness. She had a four-day episode of bloody diarrhea that resolved without treatment two weeks ago. Lumbar puncture is notable for a marked increase in CSF protein. White cell count is within normal limits, right? So hopefully you're already making a link here. Increase in CSF protein, but a normal white cell count, okay? That is a, that is a finding known as albuminocytologic dissociation, okay? So what's the bug? What's the special, what are the special characteristics of this bug, okay? What's the means of transmission? What's the classic presentation? And how is this infection treated? Okay, so this patient clearly has Guillain-Barré syndrome. Okay, remember Guillain-Barré syndrome, you do a CSF study on exams, you see an increase in protein, uh, CSF protein, but no increase in cells. Okay, that's known as albuminocytologic dissociation. There's a dissociation between the protein count, that's the albumino part, and your white cell count. Because classically, if you have a high white count, you should have a high protein count. 
okay? So having a high protein uh, amount in your CSF with a normal white cell count, that's discordant, okay? That's what's known as albuminocytologic dissociation, okay? So this person has Guillain-Barré syndrome, okay? And they tell you that, oh, two weeks ago, this person had a bloody diarrhea that resolved without treatment, okay? So hopefully you're thinking about Campylobacter jejuni, okay, C jejuni. Um, it's a gram-negative organism. It's a gram-negative curved rod. It's oxidase positive, and it actually grows at 42 degrees Celsius, okay, because uh, at 37, many things grow, but at 42, many things do not grow. Uh, I can imagine as a human being yourself, you will feel extremely uncomfortable at 42 degrees Celsius, okay, but Campylobacter jejuni, does grow really well at 42 degrees Celsius. So that's a very unique characteristic. Um, remember Campylobacter, Campfire, 42 degrees Celsius. That's another way to keep that straight in your head. Now, um, the classic association with C. jejuni is the consumption of contaminated poultry, okay? So if a person consumes hamburger or meat or chicken or whatever, and then they present with a bloody diarrhea, Okay, uh, think about Campylobacter jejuni. In fact, it's probably the most common cause, uh, very high yield to know this, is probably the most common cause of bacterial bloody diarrhea in the United States. Okay, so that's something you definitely want to keep in, want to keep in mind. Now, why do you get Guillain-Barré syndrome with Campylobacter infection? I mean, it's not everyone that gets C. jejuni infection that gets uh, Guillain-Barré syndrome. But it's a principle that they occasionally test on exams, okay? It's the principle of molecular mimicry, okay? The thing that happens here is that the antibodies that your body makes against C. jejuni cross-react with proteins in myelin, okay? So you can have a peripheral demyelinating neuropathy uh, in the setting of C. jejuni infection, okay? Uh, and that's how the person gets uh, Guillain-Barré syndrome. Uh, if they don't, if they want to mess with your head on exams, instead of putting GBS or Guillain-Barré syndrome, they can put acute inflammatory demyelinating polyneuropathy as the answer choice. Okay, AIDP. Uh, that's just code word for GBS on exams. Okay, so just another thing to keep in mind there. And the way you treat GBS, I mean the way you treat a CJ jejuni is uh, with a fluoroquinolone. Okay, like Cipro or levofloxacin or with a macrolid like erythromycin, okay? So I think with this, we are done for today. Um, I would have a dedicated podcast where I just go through trigger lists that are very useful for microbiology. I'll talk about like, uh, basically it will just be where I give you like a one-liner and you supply the name of a bug. And the one-liners, I'll group them by disease condition like diarrhea, for example, or pneumonia or STI or drugs and stuff like that. And I think there'll be a very good global micro review uh, down the line. So I wish you all the best. If you have any questions or you spot any errors, uh, please don't forget to send a comment. And uh, uh, if you have any questions, just shoot me a message at uh, Divine Intervention Podcasts at gmail.com or you can use the contact button in the website. I mean, the contact page in the website to send me a message. I'll be sure to get back to you as quickly as possible. Uh, have a wonderful week ahead and remain blessed. Thank you.